Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Dan Gingas, who is in Chicago. How are you doing, Dan? I'm great, John. Thanks so much for having me on the show today. Absolutely. And Dan's an international keynote speaker and customer experience coach who has written two books, uh, Social Co- Winning at Social Customer Care, and the new book that is launching literally in days, days away from now, The Experience Maker, How to Create Remarkable Experiences that Your Customers Can't Wait to Share. Um, so Dan, let's, let's jump uh, straight into it. And, and uh, this new book that's about to launch, what was the, what was the genesis of this, of this book? Well, it's a collection of stories, customer experience stories that I have collected over the years from both my own professional experience in corporate America for 20 years and also from talking to tons of companies, researching tons of companies, and just paying attention as a consumer. And one of the things that I see is that when you pay attention and you actually look for parts of the experience that stand out, there's a lot of really good stuff out there. And so my hope is that the examples in the book are inspirational to anyone in any kind of a business to start making their experience a little bit more memorable and therefore remarkable or worthy of remark or discussion. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting thing that you say there that you, you know, that you look at your your own customer experiences and you you observe because I always find that it it seems like that a lot of times people when they stop being a consumer and they they cross over the threshold and they become the the vendor or the the company that they forget about what it's like to be a consumer or, and the customer and the customer experience and they do everything for the wrong way around it's kind of that strange amnesia that it, it affects them once they cross that threshold uh, for sure i mean that same person that appreciates a really fine dinner at a restaurant with great service and a terrific atmosphere, then goes to work the next day and treats their their customer like an account number, right? So, you know, if you if you look back into what you like as a customer and how you like to be treated, and you think about the brands that you are most loyal to, generally those are going to be the ones that treat you the best. And you know that old saying, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's mm-hmm. it's very applicable to customer experience. It's just that, as you say, I, I haven't heard anyone call it amnesia before, but I think that's a great, <laughs> that's a really great word to use is we just forget about what a good experience looks like, and then we don't provide it to our own customers. Yeah. And the other thing, uh, Dan, uh, is that, I mean, let's face it, I mean, there's a perception uh, that most products and services are pretty much commoditized right now. At least that's the perception. So back to your point, the companies that you tend to do business with, the ones that you stick with, the experience is the key differentiator. And sometimes that means that maybe you'll you'll uh, you'll pay more, maybe you'll put up with some maybe a little less or whatever, as long as the experience, the overall overarching experience is a po- is the positive one, the one that you uh, appreciate. Well, you absolutely hit the nail on the head, John, because in almost every industry, competing on price has become a loser's game. It's a race to the bottom. We don't want to be in that race. Competing on product or service has become really tough because almost everything's commoditized. I love thinking about one of the most innovative companies in our generation, Uber, Mm -hmm. and it completely, you know, reset the taxi industry. And yet today, if you get into a car, I dare you to tell me whether it's an Uber or a Lyft. And sometimes it's both because the driver is driving for both services. The services have become almost indistinguishable from one another. So if you don't have price and you don't have product, what's left is experience. And the good news is any company can differentiate themselves based on customer experience. Not many do, but hence that's the open space for me and my book is to come tell people about how your company as well can differentiate on customer experience and become the preferred uh, supplier in your industry. 
And the, and the other thing, Dan, I think about customer experience that people sometimes overlook is that it's the totality of your experience, right? It's not because sometimes people think, oh, yeah, we have great customer. You, you, know, you call our support line and it's fantastic. And you go, well, yeah, that's great. But that's one element of, of your customer experience, because if you have a different experience somewhere else or it's inconsistent, then your overall experience is inconsistent. And if you have a negative experience somewhere, well, you're, uh, that just takes over everything anyway. Well, think about why they're calling customer service in the first place, because something went wrong. I mean, nobody calls customer service just to say hi or just to tell them they're doing a great job. So there's a quote in my book by Chris Zane, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Zane Cycles. It's a bicycle store. And he was credited as saying customer service is what happens when customer experience fails. And that is completely true. Now, customer service is a big part of customer experience because at that moment that that something has failed, we have an opportunity to either keep the customer or lose the customer. And so it becomes a very critical part of the experience. But but you're right, the totality of the experience includes everything. It includes the marketing and advertising that they see before they even become a customer. It includes the welcome letter that you send them, the packaging, the shipping, the um, if you're a SaaS company, how people log in and how they register and how they, they customize. Um, think about the last time you had to go through a forgotten password uh, uh, flow on any company. It's a pain in the neck, right? Mm-hmm. That's all part of the experience. And so the reality is the bad experiences are usually death by a thousand paper cuts. It's very rare that, you know, somebody does something so outlandish yeah. that we just immediately leave. What happens is we just get tired of the constant irritation and the constant barriers that get put up. I'll give you a really interesting example. When I was at Discover, we realized that we were standing in the way of customers doing the thing that they did most often on our website. So our data showed that people came to the website most often to view their last transactions. They wanted to make sure that, you know, the the waiter didn't add on an extra tip or whatever, that everything matched up. So they're coming by the droves. I mean, 50 million logins every month to the Discover website. This is the number one thing they do. And yet it took three clicks to get there. (laughs) So we said, well, what if we tried to reduce that. First, we reduced it to two clicks, then one click. And then ultimately we said, what if we just build a live feed on the homepage so that when you log in, the first thing you see are your most recent transactions. And what happened after that was amazing because immediately tens of thousands of people started logging onto the website and logging right off, which sounds like it's a problem, but actually it was great because we were giving the customer exactly what they wanted which was not to spend more time on their credit card website. They just wanted to come and leave. And we let them do that. And immediately our satisfaction score skyrocketed. We won the JD Power Award. And all of this stuff started happening once we realized we were the ones standing in their way. And once we got out of their way and let the customer do what they came to do, they loved us. And, and I love that's a fantastic example. Uh, and part of what I love about it as well is, let's face it, as you said, sometimes you could look at something like that and go, oh, my goodness, now they're just logging on and logging straight off again. What a disaster. Why aren't they staying on the website? But to your point is they're there. They're getting exactly what they want. And who and as you said, I mean, right at the end of the day, who really wants to hang around on a credit card website for that long uh, anyway? You, know, you want reassurance and then to be able to move on. And it's a hard thing to admit. I mean, when I went to healthcare, I had to convince my team the same thing. No one wants to come to their health insurance website. Like we do it because we have to, not because we want to. And look, there are brands that we engage with because we want to. Starbucks, Disney, Apple. But those are different kinds of brands than probably most of the people listening to this podcast. And so being upfront with yourself and really understanding like, look, we're not one of those companies. So our job is to deliver what the, we promised to the customer and then get the heck out of the way. And what was happening on the website, besides from three clicks, was we were interrupting them with pop-ups and we were trying to cross-sell them and we were trying to upsell them and all this stuff. Oh, and yeah, sometimes that works and you get a couple of cross-sells, but in the process, you irritate the thousands of other customers that say no to your cross-sell offer and click out. And it just isn't worth it. And what we found, it was it was totally worth it to just get out of their way. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I love that. And the, the healthcare one, that's another great example because, yeah, I, I know from doing my own healthcare one that I go to, uh, boy, you tend to test your patients. That does. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is, though, as we were talking about it, you know, that it, the experience is in the totality. So, I, I mean, you talk in the book, I mean, one of your chapters is about the idea of a chief experience of chief experience officer, because let's face it, if you're going to have the totality of a really great customer experience, somebody's got to be looking at it end to end. Absolutely. And the thing is, is that it is true that everyone's job is customer experience. But if you leave it at that, then what happens in reality is it becomes no one's job. And that's the problem. That's why we need a, a chief experience officer or also known as a chief customer officer. That person has the 30 foot thousand foot view that they can see the entire customer journey. And most importantly, they can work on the transitions because as companies get bigger, almost all of them become siloed. And mm -hmm. we know that if you've ever worked in corporate America, you know what I mean when, when I say silo, sure. even if you're working in some, some smaller companies. And what happens in a siloed organization is Dan is in charge of one piece of the experience. And so Dan spends all of his time focused on that part of the experience. What we need a CXO to do, and ultimately, frankly, to train Dan to do, is to, at a minimum, make sure that Dan understands where the customer came from before he got to that part of that experience and then where the customer is going next. That's the transition periods that often get mixed, missed. Now, in a sales environment, the most critical part is after the sale, immediately after mm -hmm. the sale. Because what happens, and I've been in these environments as well, the salespeople, they ring a bell, they go on a Slack channel, they celebrate together that they just got a new logo. Who are they not celebrating with? The guy that just signed the contract, right? The one that's sitting there saying, man, I hope I didn't ruin my career by doing this because I'm spending yeah. a lot of budget and I have naturally a little bit of buyer's remorse or I'm afraid <laughs> of having buyer's remorse. So invite the customer to the party when you celebrate and then make sure as a salesperson that you hang on long enough with that customer until you know that they're comfortable with their customer success team or account management team or what have you. It's like you agree to marry somebody and you walk down the aisle and you get there and the person says, well, thanks for coming. I'd now like to introduce you to my associate who's going to actually marry you, right? <laughs> that would be crazy. But, we, but salespeople do that all the time. Uh, they make the sale and then push the customer off to someone else and they're off to another sale. And customers hate that because they buy from people who they like. That's mm -hmm. what we all do naturally. It's back to this conversation of what do we do as consumers? If we have a choice between three car dealerships, we can get the same car at any of them for the same price. We're going to go to the salesperson we like every time. And so if we like that person, then we want that person to stick around. We don't want them to kick us to the curb as soon as we sign the contract. Yeah, and and there's a, there's a few things you mentioned there that you know, that I just wanted to come back on, and and it's something that I often um, talk to people about is that idea of when somebody, particularly in B two B, right? I mean, I can go out and make a B two C purchase this afternoon. I can buy the latest like Ultra 4K, whatever it is, TV. I don't even know what the latest one is, and the most it's that's like is it 8K? Ah, fantastic, <laughs> yeah. Well, I said the the most. The, the, the most that's probably going to happen to me is my wife will hit me over the head with it and ask me why I'm wasting money on this. So, um, but in a B2B situation, like you said, it can be career enhancing. It can be career limiting. If you get it right, great. If you get it wrong. So there's a lot of emotion tied up in the buyer or the buyers. And, and therefore the last thing you want them to feel is the minute the ink is dry on the contract that suddenly you don't care about them anymore because now they feel very lonely and vulnerable. You're missing and all of these people at their company are staring at them like saying, okay, show us this great thing that you just bought. Yes. And, and here's the opposite of that. Telling the customer that they just made the best decision of their career and then showing them why. So take mm -hmm. what you know is that emotion, which is they're fearful. And if they're not telling you, they're lying, right? They just yeah. signed a six-figure contract. They're, they're like, man, <laughs> hope this works. And so what you can do as an organization is to make sure they feel really good about signing that contract and that they feel like they just made a great decision. So attack what you know is that 
negative emotion that's going on. But what we, what do we do instead? We go ring a bell or go out for drinks with our other salespeople. We don't even bring the customer to the party, right? Okay. So a good thing to remember uh, that, and it's okay to still go out to drinks with the other salespeople, but just make sure that that person who just, you know, frankly invested in you, the salesperson, uh, we need to make sure we invest a little bit back and immediately. Yeah, and when that and when that person calls you up, uh, you know, a few days or two weeks later, it is don't do the oh yeah yeah great great to hear from you, Dan. Let me just transfer you over to what's his and, and sort of as if you've never met the person before because we've all had yeah. that experience. We said, wow, you changed. You know, I always say chameleons are probably great pets to have, but they're terrible in a salesperson. It's a terrible Absolutely characteristic. True. And <laughs> you know, look, it wouldn't be the first time if somebody buys from someone they like, and then get sent to an account manager that they don't particularly yeah. like or that they don't get along with. And it might be something as simple as somebody's got to go in and reassign to a different account manager and now the customer stays. But if you've already gone on to your next sale and you're not paying attention, then that sale you just worked so hard to bring in the door might be gone in 90 days because they just don't like the team that, that or they're not getting along with the team that you assign them to. So I always recommend at least 90 days that the salesperson stays actively involved. And then after that, I want you to leave your phone number and email and tell the customer, you call me anytime. If something mm -hmm. goes wrong, I want to hear about it. And that might be a year later, two years later, five years later. But as the buyer, I'm going to hold on to that business card and I'm going to know I got somebody there that's, that has my back if I need it, which again, makes me feel great about doing business with this company. Yeah, and absolutely. And the other thing you mentioned there, and I do think this is this is a huge issue that to be addressed, and that's the you know the silos, uh, because you can't have an end to end customer experience if the handoffs aren't elegant and well done. And yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, if you've worked in corporations here in America or basically anywhere, you know, a lot of people operate on the you know good fences make good neighbors kind of uh, philosophy. So they put as many barriers around themselves and focus exclusively on their part of the process without worrying about what happens before or after. But as you mentioned earlier, it's the handoffs, as we just talked about, is where a lot of the problems lie. Absolutely. And folks, this happens in digital too, all yeah. the time. I mean, have you ever been on a website and you click onto a navigation item and it's like you just went to a completely different website right? and it's like wait a minute I, i'm not even sure i'm in the right place anymore well that's because two different teams designed two different pages and nobody ever thought to go through what every customer is going to go through which is i'm going to go from one page to the next and nobody internally has seen that that's why mm -hmm. when i'm building and i spent a lot of time in my career building websites I always go through usability testing where you sit with the prospective customers and have them go and take the actions that you want them to take and watch them. They're going to struggle, especially the, if it's the first time you've designed something, they're going to struggle and they're going to tell you why they're struggling. Something as simple as tell me on this website, where would you go if you were trying to find X? And you will get, just listen to what they say. And you're going to think, my God, this is so obvious. You just go to services and then you go to the drop down and you go to here. And they're like, they don't have any idea where to go. Right. And that's a really good sign. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you should fix something and make it a little bit easier. But we don't involve the customer nearly enough when we're designing things. Um, and we don't, we, we need to continue always to have their voice in the process, to collect their feedback, to talk to them. And I don't just mean like surveys are great, NPS mm -hmm. scores are great, but I mean having a conversation with the customer one-on-one -on -one and having them walk through what it's like to be a customer. And I'm telling you, you'll be blown away when you actually ask people for this kind of feedback, you're going to get it. Prepare yourself because yeah. they're going to tell you what they like and they're going to tell you what they don't like, but all of it is super valuable. Oh yeah, no, I, I I totally agree. I mean, we do we do those business meetings regularly with customers, and you're right. Uh, what you will learn from that is amazing because I mean, let's face it, you can you can be the best designer of products or websites in the world, but the minute you release that product uh, or website, people are going to use it in ways that you didn't think you know you never conceived of, or they're going to navigate it in ways that you didn't think of. But basically, they're going to do things that you didn't anticipate so if you don't do that usability stuff you know you're you're running the risk of uh of losing people plus most people don't like change 
So just yeah. the fact that you changed it is going to cause some complaints. It happened every time we we would fix a web page or redesign a redesign the website. The first thing that would happen is you get tons of complaints. Then people get used to it and they yeah. and they move on. But it's kind of like you know every time Apple does a major update to iOS and people can't find their apps anymore, <laughs> and then two days later, maybe even two hours later, everybody's figured it out and it's not a big deal. But you have to at least be cognizant of it. Yeah, it's like that thing. Can you please stop improving the product? <laughs> right? You just leave it as it is. Stop improving it. <laughs> yes, but of course, it, you know, if we did that, we'd all still be yeah. on AOL dial-up, right? So we've exactly. got to, so innovation is great. Moving the ball forward is great. Uh, but just make sure that you bring the customer along with you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think that's the, the, the critical piece is, you know, because sometimes, let's face it, we get we get really excited about the new thing or whatever we're releasing. And just because we're excited about it, we think you should be excited about it. And as you said, maybe your initial reaction isn't excitement. Maybe it's, oh, my goodness, you know, I, I can't find what I used to be able to find easily. So you have to anticipate that and somehow find a way of, of you know, um, remediating that before it happens. Yeah. And the best thing that I always suggest, and I talk about this in the book, is to combine voice of the customer, which is VOC, with what I call actions of the customer or AOC. And uh, with apologies to the, uh, <laughs> to the rep U.S. representative in New York. Um, but when you combine voice of the customer and actions of the customer, then you get that full picture because customers aren't always going to tell you a, what they want, or B, what they're actually doing. But the data is going to show you. That's how at Discover we learned that if I asked customers, what's the first thing you do when you come to the website? They probably wouldn't have told me, look at my recent transaction. But I knew that that's what they were doing because I could see the data that showed that, right? And so once we learned that part, you combine those two things together. Uh, because look, we also learned from voice of the customer that people wanted some other data points in the transactions, right? That maybe we were, we needed to give them more information than we needed. I don't know. I can't remember what it was, but maybe we were giving them city and not state or something like that. And they, they, they wanted additional data points. Okay. That's the voice of the customer. Now the actions are showing me this is really critical because they're going here every day. You put it together and now you know where you focus. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and just and sometimes it's just the simplest of things, uh, you know, making sure that your drop downs are in the right order. So it's easy for people to find things and all of those small little things that can go a huge long way to just when people don't notice it, it's a good thing because they've just had a smooth experience. But when they notice it, yep. not so good. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well said. Well, listen, uh, Dan, this has been great. So the book is called uh, The Experience Maker, How to Create Remarkable Experiences that Your Customers Can't Wait to Share. Uh, the link to this book and the other book will be below this video and a link to Dan and all his information. But before we go, Dan, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Absolutely. Well, I am a customer experience speaker, coach, author, and podcaster. So basically, I get to live and breathe this stuff all day long. And I love helping companies and executives see the power of customer experience and become as passionate about it as I am. Uh, because when you focus on your existing customers, here's the irony for all the salespeople out here. You actually will reduce the pressure on the sales team because the more customers you're keeping, the less you need to continue acquiring. All the sales teams that I've talked to that are completely underwater with sales goals going up every year to impossible heights, if the company was looking at all the customers going out the back door and focusing on some of them, then they'd be able to have more reasonable goals for their salespeople. So this is really important. It's important to B2B companies uh, as well as B2C. Uh, so I'll help you check it out. And uh, I'm at dangingis.com. One of the things that I do is I practice what I preach. So the book talks about being responsive. If you reach out to me, I promise to respond back. Yeah, listen, fantastic. Uh, and, and thanks, Dan. And Dan has been a, a guest before and he's been on some of our panel discussions. So if you want to know anything about customer experience, I would encourage you to reach out and check out Dan and his work. All right. Well, my name is John Golden. Uh, thank you all for listening and watching it. And I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.